Okay, then let's start. Uh, welcome. Welcome everybody to this panel discussion on text mining. I'm here with uh, uh, Professor Dursun Delen and Scott Fincher. So I wanted to say a few words uh, about our panelists, but then uh, I don't know, uh, Professor Dursun Delen has so many uh, achievements that it's going to be quite long to say. So he's of course an experienced teacher, he's a researcher and advisor in the field of machine learning, text mining of course, since today we have the panel on text mining and data science in general. He's currently the holder of uh, Williams Pierce Endowed Chair in Business Administration, the Director of research, for Re of research for the Center of Health System Innovation, and the Regent Professor of Management Science and Information Systems at Oklahoma State University. Of course, he's also the author of countless scientific papers and books. Welcome, uh, Professor Delen. And then we have Scott Fincher, he's a data scientist in the evangelism team at NIME, so he's working with me, uh, he's, a, he's, my, he's a colleague of mine, and uh, uh, he currently focuses on text mining techniques and applications, and he's uh, one of the biggest contributors on the NIME forum. So if you, uh, uh, you probably, if you follow the NIME forum, you probably know him already uh, from his answers on the, on the NIME forum. Uh, we are going to talk about the text mining today, so I would like to remind you about a few things before we start. Um, so first of all, um, uh, we are going to talk about the text, the NIME text processing extension. You can use it, you can see here all the nodes and the categories that it includes. It has a bunch of nodes for um, importing the text data, processing text data, enriching that, transforming that, calculating the frequencies of the words and mining the text data. Um, the previous webinar, so this is the follow-up to the previous webinar text mining techniques. It was held on June 25 and this link you are going to receive the slides at the end of this uh, 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 webinar. And this, the, this, is, uh, this link is the, to the recording of the previous webinar now on YouTube. Um, the next webinar is uh, from Words to Wisdom and it, it has a number of case studies of use cases we have been working on uh, recently. So it's October 1st, 5 p.m. Uh, Central European time. And then finally, we are going to hold a new course on text processing. Uh, is uh, on November 16, 17. And if you stay until the end, there might be a discount code for you uh, to participate in, in the course. Um, since this is a panel, we are waiting for your questions. Uh, to ask a question, please um, click on the Q&A button here, and then you can type your questions in, your question in there. Of course, we expect a lot of questions. We actually already have received a lot of questions at the registration time. So uh, if, you want that, if you want that a question is answered uh, with more urgency than other questions, then please upvote it with a thumb up. Okay, then we can start. Let me stop sharing. Okay. Ooh, okay, there are already quite some questions. Um, okay, so I will start with a basic question uh, that we got from uh, uh, the registrations um, because it's a kind of a beginner, beginning kind of question. So when uh, uh, you start a new data science project on text mining, that's usually something that uh, pops up uh, in the mind of a beginner. So um, how would you proceed if the information is not contained in one location like PubMed, but distributed in many individual websites and blog posts? So I think this question is for Scott. So uh, getting data from a bunch of different sources is, is a problem you may run into, right? Um, if you have data, for example, in you know local files on your local machine, maybe it's a Word file or a PDF, um, you can use a node specific for text processing called the Tika parser. Um, and that will allow you to load in several different types of those local flat files. And in fact, you can do several groups of them at once. So if I you know, had a whole bunch of literature that I was trying to mine uh, several different papers maybe of a particular type, I, maybe I have 20 or 50 papers in a folder on my machine, I just take the Tika parser node in NIME, I point it at that folder um, and let it do its thing. And it'll convert those um, for me automatically so that I can start my standard uh, text processing stuff. Um, 
so you know there's other different places where you may be getting this type of information um, you know maybe you have data you need to parse that's in a database right different strings um, you know maybe you've taken uh, information from social media loaded it into a database somewhere. Um, so then you could use, in that case, NIMES DB nodes uh, to access different flavors of databases. So we have DB nodes for, you know, common ones like Oracle and MySQL and Postgres. So you can just um, basically load those databases up, pull the information from the table, get your extract, and then send that downstream to do the typical text processing you would do. Um, Some place else you may want to try and pull data from are web pages. Maybe you need to do some web page scraping. Um, in that case, you could use NIME's web page retriever node uh, to be able to, you know, pull the HTML and parse it a little bit um, to get rid of some of the tag information and things like that and, and get just the text information that you're interested in. Um, you know, there's all sorts of other nodes here, you know, nodes for dealing with uh, Twitter directly. If you want to pull tweets for a sentiment analysis type of project, you could do that. Um, if you have a need for using a REST API to access some remote resource, you could use a GET request node to go out and pull information. So all sorts of different ways that you could tackle um, getting this information. But one of the really nice things about NIME is that it makes it easy once you've gotten uh, text data from those different sources to blend it together. Um, so we have several different workflows for all of those things that I mentioned on the hub that could help you know, kind of get you started with that process. There is one question that uh, uh, I think actually was also asked on the forum. Um, so it says that I have Word files in a folder um, and the files are uneven. So while they have columns, they have different numbers of columns. So those are not Excel files that can be merged. The files are named in a way that doesn't show their content, and he would like to rename the files, including content from the third row in a column, in a specific column. How can he do that? Yeah, that's a pretty specific question, but maybe just as a general approach, something you might try, um, you know, using a file list node to look at all the files that are in a particular folder, just to you know, find out what they are. And then once you have that list of the files, then you could build a loop around them. Once you build that loop, then you could use um, the Tika parser, for example, the one that I just mentioned to actually do the reading for those files. And then, you know, you mentioned some information about the header. Um, you need to look for the header and parse it. Um, you might have to try a few different approaches to do that because especially if your headers don't always have the same format in every file so that might be the tricky part but if you're able to parse it then you could take that header information and transform it into a flow variable and create some sort of new file name based on that flow variable that might be a little more descriptive right and then then you could write that file out so i mean that's one particular approach and as rosaria said i think i think we answered this one on the forum i didn't someone else did um but maybe this gives you a little bit of a slightly different way to think about that. Um, so I think we have examples for this um, similar to this one. It's on Excel file, but it includes a loop. And so another question, just to uh, reconnect to this question. Another question if, is if we have examples uh, to grab data. So for example, how to grab data from a PDF, from a doc file or web scraping. Um, yes, so we do have several examples, and in fact, I've pulled some of these up in NIME um, already, so maybe I will just briefly try to share my screen and just really quickly show. So um, I have pulled up here in NIME, um, for example, if we wanted to blend data from a few different sources. I mentioned um, this Tika parser node here, which we have at the beginning uh, to read in some Word data from a docx file, right? This could be anything. It could be PDF files. There's a whole bunch of different file types that the Tika parser supports. Um, so, you know, we could blend or we could read that in with the Tika parser and then kind of do the typical uh, pre-processing steps that we might need to do, you know, things like filtering and stemming, um, removing stop words and uh, getting rid of punctuation and all that sort of stuff. We could do that on this top branch. And then maybe, you know, in this particular example workflow, we also want to blend that data with some information that we've gotten off of the web. So we could provide a list of URLs 
um, with a table creator to the web page retriever. The web page retriever goes and grabs that information off a web page and then you can do some XPath parsing on it to actually pull out the information that you need. And then what's happening downstream here is just um, some other post processing and blending. This is on the our example server. Um, we can send out links to exactly where I found these on the hub um, to show you. Uh, and in fact, it's probably worth talking about the hub just briefly since I'm already sharing my screen. Um, where, so I found this workflow on the NIME hub. If you haven't seen the hub before, this is just going to allow you to search for you know, different workflows, different nodes, different extensions, and different components, all of which you kind of have, you see the existing numbers or what we have supported listed here. So if I search, for example, you know, the text processing extension, hopefully you already have all this installed since you're on this webinar. But if I search for the text processing extension, then, you know, here it is, right? It, I can click on NIME text processing, and I even have this ability to drag and drop this little icon into my NIME directly. If I wanted to do that, it's going to, you know, if I drag it in, it's going to install the text processing extension for me. Now, in my case, it doesn't do that because I already have it installed. Um, but if you don't, then it'll help you do that. But, you know, maybe instead of looking for an extension, you know, I want to find a workflow on, uh, you know, parsing data with Twitter, right? So I could search for Twitter. We have a workflow built by one of our data scientists, Paulo, for, uh, you know, pulling data off Twitter again, right? So it shows you a picture of the workflow so you get an idea kind of what it does. I could take this and drag it to my NIME and it's going to load up automatically. And the nice thing about the stuff that's on the hub is it comes with data. Right. So we're trying to give you an example of how these things work, but also include the data so that you can actually execute it, play with it yourself and get an idea of how things are supposed to go. Then you swap out, you know, your real data and the actual processing steps that you want to do and kind of make it your own. So um, if you haven't played around with the hub, I would encourage you to because it's a super useful resource for finding these particular use cases, whether it's, you know, loading and blending data or doing some things like you know, sentiment analysis or uh, topic extraction, kind of these typical um, text processing use cases you might do. We have examples of all of that type of stuff on the hub that you can go and search for and find. Um, so about the question before, uh, with the uneven columns, it's, it's quite specific. So if the more de details are needed, please send us an email um, uh, through the uh, registration form. Um, okay, so I have one more question about the data access. So I think I, if there are no more questions, I think I will ask that and then I will continue with some other uh, topics uh, for the questions. So this question is, what about connecting to repositories on the cloud? So what about connecting to S3 specifically, but I guess also blob storage would be an option. Uh, yeah, so we have nodes that are available for uh, connecting to Google Cloud, for connecting to Amazon, for connecting to Azure. Um, so if you have, you know, whatever data stored in the cloud, you need to uh, pull it down. Uh, you can use those nodes to do that. And again, I, I guess I would suggest the best place to find those is by looking on the hub um, to search for, you know, GCP, Google Cloud, uh, Amazon, AWS. Uh, we recently um, released a blog post that talks about blending S3 data with uh, Amazon DynamoDB, or maybe we haven't released that yet. Maybe that one's still upcoming. Um, but we, you know, for those types of cloud use cases, if we have a specific example, um, you know, oftentimes we'll try to write that up to show you step by step exactly how that's going to work. Um, something else that's available apart from the blog posts themselves is our uh, Will They Blend series, which is um, a book that we have recently republished with some new um, collections in it that just talks about blending all sorts of different data sets uh, with NIME, not just text data for text processing, but all sorts of other stuff. And some of these cloud uh, access types of use cases and example workflows are in that book as well. So if you're interested in that, you can, um, you can pull down the Will They Blend book free from our NIME Press site. Okay. Uh, one more question uh, arrived now. When you say cloud use cases, does that mean reading S3 buckets, website hosted, any limits? Uh, yes, S3 buckets in particular, uh, the nodes support that, um, as well as, like I said, you know, Azure and Google Cloud, you can um, grab the files directly out of there. Um, 
are the and I guess part of the what was the other part of that question whether there were any limits or not yeah if there are, yeah. I don't I'm not a I don't believe so um, this is not something I'm doing every day so hoping I hoping I'm not missing some nuance of your question but I don't I don't think so I mean you you know you pay for these services right and so NIME is going to just allow you the nodes and the features to be able to access essentially what you're paying for already Perfect. Oh, REST APIs and Lambda calls. This is a follow-up to that same one. Um, yes, so um, you can use NIME's uh, REST nodes. We have a GET request, POST request, a couple of other ones as well. The GET and POST are the most common um, to be able to write your own um, calls against other REST APIs. Um, and I should mention, too, um, that if you have NIME server, which is not really what we're talking about today, but if you have a NIME server license, um, you can actually make calls to the NIME server to execute workflows. So that that's a bi-directional functionality with REST. Okay, perfect. So basically there are no limits, uh, unless no. of course depends on what you connect to, depends on uh, the receiving end. Um, okay. so. If there are no more questions about accessing data, I would move to the, the text processing features. Um, so here, the first question was, uh, um, it's for Dursun, and it's, uh, what does tokenization refer to? Thank you, Rosaria. Tokenization is one of the fundamental functions in text mining, where you take the, uh, the textual content and break it down into its subunits, the components, if you will. And those components could be single words or it could be multiple words using engrams. But the idea is that we take this, this um, textual content and convert it into its lowest level denominator, the, the, the constituents, the words and, and numbers. And then we do additional pre-processing to maintain only textual content and maybe even simplify that and then do some kind of mining on that textual content. So there is a follow-up to this question. It says, what, what tokenizer sh should I use then? I mean, I guess they refer to the strings to document node and then you have to choose the tokenizer there. So what Correct. tokenizer? Well, um, there are several basic ones uh, in that particular node. Um, some tokenizers might be language specific. So you will see English tokenizer there. Um, and then there's also white space tokenizers. They do a slightly different. So English, the language specific tokenizer will take into account the, the language specific syntax, whereas white space tokenizer will find the white space and separate the words and then use them as lowest level representations for creating future space. So in a sense, you can use white space tokenizer in a language agnostic manner, because it doesn't actually know what language it's actually attacking to. Whereas language specific ones are gonna create probably a little more meaningful tokens, which might be only a few percentage point difference between the white space and, and language, but language is gonna be a little more language specific representation that it will take into account. Uh, when it creates the, uh, the words and in, 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 in grams. I have two questions now on, on stop words. So the first one just arrived and he wants to exclude specific words from the stop word filter. Um, so it, it says specifically, I want to keep not for building engrams and think this is a stop word. So how can I basically customize my stop word filter? Here, the other question is, how do I create a dictionary? Like for example, a stop word dictionary. Um, Scott, yeah, okay. Yeah, I, I think those questions are kind of interrelated, right? So yeah. um, if when you use the stop word filter in NIME, um, by default, it has several different stop word dictionaries or lists built in already um, for several languages, right? So. English, German, Spanish, and there are several more. Um, you know, most of the time those work fine, but then you have sometimes these more specialized cases like it has been asked about here, where you want to make sure that you have um, only specific words in the stop word filter, and you don't want to include things like not or other, you know, negatory modifiers that could um, change the meaning of your text. So in that case, if you want to incorporate a, a custom dictionary, that's not a problem. You'll notice if you look at the stop word filter, it actually has an optional 
um, white input port on it. And what that input port is there for is to allow you to provide your own dictionary if you want to do that. So all you need to do is just provide your own dictionary. And what that dictionary looks like is it's just a single column in NIME with um, all the rows representing all your different stop words. You just basically have this single column list of all the different words you want to provide. You feed that into the node and then you, you tell the node, use the one I've provided instead of the built-in list and go about your business. So you may want to have several different stop word um, custom dictionaries depending on what it is you're trying to do, right? And so then you just um, select and load in the, the one that you want to use. It's, it's pretty straightforward to be able to swap that out. We have a question now about tagging. So we want to use NLP to tag some text. Um, and then it says that, uh, um, so what, which one shall I use? And uh, the Stanford NE learner, the node, uh, is a very time consuming process. Or the alternative is the dictionary tagger, which is faster, but it, cannot, it can't land on a best fit model to use for vaccination name like Abner. So what is it? Uh, or is it better to use some other techniques? So what should people do to, for the best tagging procedure? Learn a model, apply a dictionary tagger, or something else? You know, it's always the trade-off, right? <clears throat> if you try to learn a model, it will be time demanding, but it will be more semantically driven. Whereas if you wanna do a quick and dirty job, then you're gonna go with the, the dictionary tagger. So um, it's the trade-off, I guess. Uh, how can you find the, the ground between the two? Um, that's, that's a question that does not have an answer per se. So um, if the computational resources are there, if you have large enough data, and if you have the patience to do so, it's always better to go with the, uh, the, the system that actually learns uh, from a provided data set. Scott, do you have anything to add that? Yeah, I mean, that's pretty much what I was going to say. I mean, you, you know, if, if you have the ability and the time and the resources to build the model, then you'd want to do that. But, you know, as is mentioned in the question, that's a time consuming process. So I guess they're hitting a resource bottleneck there. Um, but it's most likely going to give you the best answers in the long run. So I, I think I would try to devote those extra resources there if I can. And, you know, usually on those kind of situations, if you have a server-based infrastructure that you can tap into where you can offload your your time-demanding task to a, a, a cloud-based uh, computational infrastructure, then, then it would uh, not feel as, as, as painful as, as it might if you're running it on your own, own computer resources. Somewhat related, is there a name entity recognizer you would recommend for use in NIME? So there's the Stanford NLP named entity tagger uh, node. There's actually two of those. It's the, there's the learner and then the tagger, because uh, you often have this like learn predict motif in NIME that you see a lot. Um, that's the one that we generally talk about when we're um, introducing this concept of named entity training in the course. Um, if there's something specialized uh, that you wanted to look at, maybe in, in, in R or Python, I, I mean, I, I guess we could take that approach as well. But the, my, first one, my first suggestion would be the Stanford NLP named entity approach. We had a webinar at the end of uh, July that was talking about some approaches for named entity, for example, for deep learning. So you can, of course, rely on something that already exists. If I find it, now I'm going to quickly search on YouTube. And I'm going to post the link on, uh, uh, on the chat. Okay. Okay. So... Um, let's now it seems we are moving okay it seems you are moving towards the use cases and the case studies uh, so a typical question um, this is the topic with uh, with most questions from the attendees use cases so what are the main use cases for text mining I think this is for Durson since he has a lot of experience thank you years everybody. and years of experience yeah uh, so the, the typical use cases for text mining, uh, if you want to create a text item, you can say supervised, unsupervised kind of machine learning analogy. 
and then you can list them underneath it. But if you look at the the, the most commonly executed and probably most benefited uh, text mining use cases, uh, it would be probably sentiment analysis, uh, both on the, the the supervised and unsupervised. Um, and then topic detection is gaining a lot of ground, uh, kind of identifying the natural topics in a collection of documents. If you have a whole bunch of uh, textual content documents and then you already have um, ground truth about them, the labels, you can use all kinds of classification type of algorithms to read the mapping between the two and then use that to classify additional textual content. Social media mining is, is quite popular. How can I, um, again, um, access the data, either automatically or semi-automatically kind of grabbing it from a database or maybe scraping it from, from websites and then uh, doing all kinds of classification, clustering or topic detection type of um, um, applications, the case studies on it. One area that I use text mining uh, as a case study more than any other is in literature mining because there's so many articles that are being published out there. Can you have text mining to kind of pre-read it for you and then kind of figure out the <clears throat> commonly occurring themes and topics and maybe even laying it over a, a time dimension to see which topics are getting more popular or what are the cycles that kind of dictates within each of those topics. Um, and especially if it's applied to medical literature, uh, because there's thousands of, of journals out there that publish similar articles, and there's no way a human being can actually browse through them. So through this digital libraries, you can access and then mine those to find interesting patterns in, in textual content. And just one quick example <clears throat> is that because probably people couldn't get out uh, during COVID-19 uh, and still partially the case, uh, the academics <clears throat> wanted to do literature uh, or, or research and, and publications in COVID-19. And, and I actually compiled a, a database of published articles, both peer-reviewed and non-peer-reviewed pre-published uh, um, over 200,000 of them published in within about three months. So there's no way you can go through them. And that's one area that we, with a colleague of mine, are actually using text mining to figure out what is in that 200,000 plus articles. What are they talking about? What are the themes and, and, uh, and dominance of, of, of different um, topics within that collection of, uh, of textual content? Okay, so here there is a case study. So there, somebody is working on, uh, we are studying on small texts such as Facebook posts. I wonder which of the n-gram outputs can be the best option to detect the topic. The n-gram creator node provides three outputs, frequencies of sentence, document, and corpus. I think this is uh, referring to what the node produces and what they should use for um, uh, to understand, to summarize, or to understand the small text from the base Facebook I mean, post. I, I guess it's going to depend, right? It's going to depend on um, the nature of your data as to whether, uh, you know, what size of ingram is actually potentially going to reveal any additional information there, which you then might be able to further assess with topic modeling downstream in the workflow. So you might, you know, in the topic modeling process, you might actually try to extract maybe two grams, three grams, four grams, um, and see if that has any effect on uh, what you're able to pull out. I mean, that would kind of be my first guess would be just to play around with that a little bit and see. It It might be that ingrams don't really give you that much value, um, depending on what you're looking at, right, Derson? Correct, absolutely. It's a iterative process. You you start with the, the lower level of engrams, two and maybe three, four would be a stretch perhaps, but then again, you can try that as well and look to see what it actually generates in the engram space and and uh, and decide where the you know, quote unquote optimal N would be in the engram generation for the purpose that you're gonna be using the output. This classification is a sentiment analysis, 
um, and then whichever the one that actually produces better results will be your choice. But it's, again, there is not a best answer to those kind of things since it's more of an art. So you just have to try and, and, and figure it out yourself. I know it's a little bit time, time demanding, but most everything that you do in data science in machine learning requires you know, some iterative process that kind of quote unquote at some level optimize certain parameters. And in this case, your parameter is the value of n in your n graphs. I would like to go back to one of the questions from the registrations. Um, so this is a question from a beginner. Can you recommend a few use cases to learn text mining for beginners? Uh, yeah, let me, in fact, I have some workflows pulled up, so I'll just briefly share my screen again. So um, again, I went and I just found some of these on the NIME hub, um, which you can do too. If you were to go out and search for um, sentiment analysis or sentiment classification, this is one you would find. And so um, I think for a beginner, sentiment analysis is a good place to start because it kind of wraps up several aspects of um, classification around text and you, you need to kind of be able to grasp and use all of those different um, bits and pieces to you know do the whole analysis. So this is going to be everything from you know starting reading in the data, doing the transformation of strings to documents, all of the kind of required pre-processing steps that you need to do as part of a text processing analysis. And then here because we're doing classification, the conversion from you know, English readable space to a mathematical representation uh, term document matrix of our data set, and then actually building out, in this case, a decision tree, a pretty straightforward, simple classification model to actually do predictions. This, I should have said, um, this workflow uses IMDB data, so it's movie reviews, it's trying to predict, you know, whether people felt positively or negatively about movies. So this build out, builds out the model and then has some uh, model evaluation metrics like using a rock curve or using a confusion matrix to see how you did. So that's a, a relatively straightforward one you want to might look at. Um, there's also one for topic extraction. So a lot of times people say, you know, I've got these different texts. How can I tell what folks are talking about, right? Maybe I think I have three different topics that are being discussed in this corpus or five or whatever. So here's a fairly simple workflow that reads in some restaurant reviews, does the pre-processing, and then does topic extraction using the LDA algorithm to be able to pull out what some potential topics would be along with the words that describe what those topics are and their weights. Um, so that's another pretty straightforward one that is uh, good for a beginner to understand. And then also um, you probably would like to have a good handle on visualization, at least some of the basic visualizations associated with text processing. So um, here's a good example from, again, one of our data scientists, Paolo, that reads in some data from Twitter, does a Twitter search basically um, around some recent COVID-19 tweets and builds an interactive tag cloud. So you can see at a glance, you know, in your corpus, what are people actually talking about um, with a word cloud. And so NIME makes it pretty easy to build those. But um, again, as a beginner, probably something you would want to try to understand how to do. And this, this workflow combines both pulling from Twitter, from social media, and that visualization component. So all three of those, I think, are probably pretty good for beginners. Um, several different interesting things to touch on there. So and we again, have we will, I'm sorry, we'll, we'll make sure to send out links to these so that you can have them. But of course, you can just do like I did and go out on the NIME hub and search and you'll probably find them yourself too. Um, so uh, there is another question about uh, CRM data and the way, so what we can do with what people write in the CRM. I'm just going to summarize what's in the question. Um, so it says, I already tried to do some text mining in order to pull trading word, sent word sentences, but I would like to potentialize much more the use of that information. If we have any suggestion and how can I use NIME4? We have another question from the registration that is asking, what is the most common algorithm to extract topics from a text unsupervised? Okay, on, on CRM side, the most commonly uh, practiced method is to look for sentiments. Perhaps that's where you start. So in sentiment analysis, you label 
each customer review each text to, textual content to be positive, negative, or neutral. So the ones that are positive and negative, you can probably group them together. And within those groups to look for what are the features, what are the keywords, what are the, the, the specific content that uh, the customers or potential customers or past customers are bringing up when they're talking, speaking positively about your products your services. Another thing to, to look at is that maybe not just your own products, your own services, but also your direct competitors' products and services, kind of competitive intelligence, and see what they are saying about other products similar to yours versus your products on the, the positivity, negativity, which service components and product features they are mentioning when they talk positively, negatively. Uh, about and then make that that intelligent comparison and turn that into uh, perhaps uh, something to act on, you know, which features to focus on your products, which features to improve in your services, and where are you leading against your direct competitors, where are you kind of lagging behind compared to your competitors' products and services. But usually it's, that's where, 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 where you, uh, get the most value out of your text mining exercises is the sentiment analysis and post analysis kind of characterization and, and, and action generation. So there is a, oh, sorry. On the LDA, uh, so, so there was like two questions, I think, right? Uh, so the, the, the LD is one of the most popular topic detection, topic identification, topic mo modeling or mining algorithms out there, it looks like, for the last 10 plus years. And um, NIME actually has a, a, a node, Parallel LDA, that does a pretty good job, even for moderately sized corpuses to identify the natural topics in a given textual content. So idea here is to find what are the topics that can describe the documents. Um, kind of aggregating from the words and engrams at the level of concepts, the themes that are buried within the, the documents and then based on that kind of describing and characterizing the documents. So if there are more questions about LD, we will probably get a little deeper on, on how it does what it does. Rosaria? Uh, there is one question about LDA. Um, the, if, we, if, we can, if we have any suggestion to make it faster, if we have a special software for LDA, I don't know if it's referring to the I mean, nine I, LDA or some other LDA. Yeah, I mean, I there's what Dursan mentioned. There's basically a, the the parallel LDA node, and if you're using that node and you feel like it's taking a long time, I mean, you may want to. Um, I mean, first of all, make sure you're not going crazy with the number of topics and number of uh, terms for topic you're trying to extract, right? You want to make sure that those parameters are set to be reasonable. Um, you can also reduce the number of iterations that the model takes to run or the node takes to run right because it's an it's an iterative model it's trying to reduce um, the log likelihood and maybe you don't need the default which i think is a thousand iterations right for the model to converge maybe it converges at a very much lower number so if you just you know set that number of iterations lower it's going to run faster um i, I would i guess i would say just in general not specifically about lda but about performance and i'm something we always tell our students they're starting um, in the text processing course is you want to make sure that you have enough memory devoted to NIME, which you can make a change in the NIME any file to do that. Just because text processing nodes generally um, are a little more uh, demanding on your system memory and resources than some of the standard nodes are. So you can, um, you can bump up the amount of RAM available to NIME. You know, if it's defaulting to like two or four gigabytes on your system, you probably definitely want to turn that up and make sure that um, you're making the most use out of what your computer has available. So just some quick and easy ways maybe you could increase the, um, the LDA speed there. And just to quickly add to it, uh, LDA is a, uh, is a uh, algorithm that can be used in parallel uh, fashion. So it actually splits the work into to multiple um, simultaneous parallel processes. So if you can allocate more processor to the algorithm, because it's designed to actually run on multiple processors at the same time, 
then it will um, it will run faster. Another thing that you might want to think of is that if it's taking too long and you're getting bored of it, maybe use a subset of the data to kind of do your initial work to see if it's actually generating anything meaningful and then push the whole data set into your LDA and let it run maybe a few minutes, maybe uh, a little more than a few minutes and then see what, what comes out of it. Okay. So I have a bunch of questions. So one is uh, just came in now is, uh, can I use the ontology format like the OWL for topic extraction using NIME nodes? And I was trying to put a, put a link on the, on the chat, but please answer. That's a good question. I don't really have an answer whether or not we can do that in NIME. I haven't seen it. Scott might know. I yeah, I, I haven't seen it either. Yeah, I do. I do. <laughs> and that's what I, that's what I'm trying to do actually while I'm reading. And so there is a link on the Nime Hub. Uh, somebody explored uh, a pizza making using an ontology, an OWL uh, ontology file. If I okay, I, I'm going to put eventually the link on uh, um, on the chat. Excellent. Uh, excellent. I think that's a great question, by the way. Uh, if you're and actually, I've, I've got, I can at least um, pull it up maybe just briefly because I found it, Rosario, just to show. Yeah, right. People. Um, on the hub, if you search for that one. OWL pizza, then you'll find it right away. <laughs> and so this is using um, some SparkQL nodes, I think, to actually implement some of this processing. Um, but we have a whole blog post written about this, and the link to the blog post is down here at the bottom. Um, so if you search for OWL and pizza, you'll find this example workflow with the data, with the blog post, and that should get you where you need to go. So yes, it is possible. Um, I think somebody has done it and it's on the NIME hub. Okay, so let's have a look at another question. Um, another question is talking about LDA. Um, how large does the document collection need to be to apply LDA meaningfully? Another question where there is no one answer. It all depends, right? Um, I like large data because we, when we moved from traditional statistics to analytics, we said we don't have to restrict ourselves to a sample of the data. Let's use D data, the population of data. So larger is always better as long as your data is of high quality, meaning that it's all coming from the same domain related to the problem that you're analyzing. And given that you would have the, the both hardware and software infrastructure to handle the size of the data. Again, as I said before, when I do uh, analytics on a very large data set, I usually start with a sample of the data. Again, as I said, sampling is not good in analytics data science, but in this case, just for let me see if it works. Let me see what kind of workflow can actually handle the data set. And then once I know at least a good portion of how to do it from end to end with a small data, then I start to work with the large data so I can actually afford to spend um, on the data, uh, you know, more than, than I would have otherwise. Are there any alternatives to the LDA? There used to be, and there still are. So, so precursor to LDA, there there was the LSI, latent semantic index in latent semantic, and else depending on which school of thought you're talking to, more linguistic they call it LSI, more analytics they used to call it LSA, which did a pretty good job that uses singular value decomposition to identify quote unquote topic like structures within the a collection of documents, and then LDA kind of dominated for almost 10 years, but I think that things are moving a little towards uh, deep learning, uh, RNN, LSTM, work to WAG, uh, word to VAC, uh, word embedding type of algorithms. So the, the difference is that this new generation of algorithms because of the, the short term memory, they actually take into account the context within which the word actually appears in the document. So what comes before, what comes after, that that sequential relationship can be taken into account is that actually turns the, the textual content into information and actionable inside afterwards. Yes, there's plenty of stuff out there and it's one of the most active field of research, uh, both academics and, and 
in a lot of the the big companies, Google and and, and Facebook and uh, you know data, the textual content rich companies are investing tremendous amount of <clears throat> effort and money into it. And most of them are making their findings publicly available. So within nine, if you cannot find what you're gonna do and you might actually have an algorithm already written in Python, you can always use the nodes in Naeem to kind of tap into those resources, kind of Python or, or R scripting to, to execute it side by side with its equivalent in Naeem and kind of compare the outcomes. So one more question about tagging again. What's the best tag type tag value to use for vaccination names? So maybe I can take that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm not a not a life scientist. So, um, I, but but having said that, if you look in the dictionary tagger node, um, there's a tag type called pharma, and then there's a tag value called drug. So to me, that makes the most sense. There's also another tag value there called compound, and then one called unknown, which you could just use as a catch-all. So I guess in that case, I would try the tag type pharma. You also could use um, the tag type NE, which stands for named entity. And there's also a value of unknown in there. So it's really up to you. I mean, there's a, a few here that I think could, you know, maybe match up. One of the things that um, I've talked about with uh, our developers as maybe a future feature, and if you guys would like to see this, I'd love to hear about it, would be um, a way for you to provide your own tag types and your own tag values that you could uh, assign at the beginning of your workflow so that you're not just restricted to the ones we provide. I mean, we provide a lot, but sometimes it, it's just easier even to be able to set your own. So it's something we're thinking about doing. But to circle back, in this case, I would say um, use the pharma tag type and then one of those associated tag values, probably drug. There are a few questions about deployment. Um, so th uh, the first question, uh, can I export workflows from NIME as REST services or web applications? Uh, yes, so you can do that. You can set up a workflow to run on uh, NIME server, for example, and then call that workflow using the REST API from a completely separate application. I mean, we have uh, some of our customers in production um, there's one example of them using an iPhone application where the iPhone application takes some input from the user um, that they need and then sends those inputs as inputs to the model using a REST API and it calls the model to do a prediction in real time. That prediction is returned back to the application on the user's phone so that the user isn't aware of it, but they're actually getting a real time model prediction using Nine. It's completely you know, opaque to them, they don't know that, but that's what's happening. And so we have, you know, that's one example of a way that you could use an external application to call it, but you can also have workflows call other workflows. You can um, you know, schedule execution of workflows. Um, but yeah, you, on the NIME server, that's a, that's specific to NIME server, um, the REST API call feature. There is another question. If I build a model, how stable will it be over time? Good question. And I'm assuming that this is uh, probably a more supervised classification or regression type of uh, models they're referring to. And uh, one example that I can provide, and I actually use that as a motivational example, is to predict the financial success of, of Hollywood movies. So how stable or accurate the movie uh, prediction model would be over time. So it all depends upon what kind of drives the output, whether or not it's a steady or stable domain that you're predicting that doesn't actually change over time. If it does change, then then, then you'll have to retrain or recalibrate your uh, uh, your model. Um, regardless, though, uh, I think when you put the model in deployment, you have to put some means around it that checks its accuracy over time. As soon as the the actual labels, the numbers of target variable becomes available. You check to, to see what you predicted and what the actual was, and then kind of track that over time to make sure that your model is producing accurate enough results for you to base your decision. Okay. And then how, if my model is not, uh, working anymore? How can I adapt it to the new world? Um, no, the, the, the short answer would be recreate it, start from scratch, grab large enough, most recent data, 
um, spend a lot of time understanding your feature space, understanding how you represent your variables, kind of putting yourself um, in the perspective of the machine learning algorithms that they're going to be using. Some, some algorithms likes numbers, some likes, you know, sets the, the, the nominal valued variables and then build the best model accordingly. Uh, the area of calibrating models, making models learn over time, kind of adding knowledge to their existing prediction model is still a work in progress. There is a tremendous amount of research out there that says, with the new data becomes available, can I adjust the model without recreating it? Uh, the answer is yes, but it's still in the laboratory environment, as far as the practicality is concerned, it still uh, may not be there for practical purposes. If your data is not huge, I would say the best approach would be just create the model again and use your best practices. And I would add on to that too, that people are having to do that a lot right now because of the times we're in, right? You know, models that were built in November, December, 2019, um, are not cutting it anymore, right? And it's not because the algorithms have changed, it's because the nature of the underlying data has changed. The assumptions that were made in building those models just don't hold anymore for things like, uh, you know, customer purchases and stuff like that. But cer certainly that could apply in a text processing context too. So um, there ultimately may be no other solution than, as Derson suggested, rebuild from the ground up using, you know, a new stream of data that's been coming in more recently. We have uh, the, last, the last questions, I think, because we are uh, reaching the one hour. Um, so any advices for beginners who start now to learn about text, text mining? Yeah, um, sure. I, I think if you're just starting out, one of the things you want to make sure you do is try to understand the jargon uh, specific to text mining. So um, even within data science kind of as a whole, um, there are certain disciplines that have their own terminology and things you need to understand. I, you know, life science, I'm sure, is that way. Um, text mining is too. So you'll want to make sure you understand the jargon. And then to go along with that, when you're working with text data, there's very typically this common set of pre-processing steps that you need to do kind of regardless of the data that you're starting with, right? So you're always going to want to go in, in, in NIME anyway, convert strings to documents, uh, right off the bat, you always want to do your filtering, do your stemming, or maybe limitization if you prefer that, um, uh, you know, filtering out punctuation, just kind of those cleanup things that you always have to do to start this. So you'll want to become, as a beginner, really familiar with each of those steps, why they're needed and how to do it. Um, and then at the very beginning, I think, you know, the way I learned was to start with sentiment analysis. I, you know, there's lots of good data sets out there. The IMDB movie uh, review data set is a good one to be able to do not just the processing of the data, but then actually do something useful with it to build a model to predict something using that text data. So that, that's where I would start was with those things. And any advice for the expert text miners? Good question. Um... Text mining itself, the whole field, is progressing probably faster than it used to. Uh, now that we have the, the hardware and software that can handle uh, the kind of data that we used to only dream about handling. And um, again, led by the, the leading companies like Google and others uh, building this deep learning driven text mining uh, modules, algorithms, case studies. Um, I think that will be the, the angle that I would uh, suggest the text mine experts to look into because the next generation, maybe next few years, maybe a decade or so, we're going to be using tremendous amount of data and then we'll probably do use that on a, on a some kind of deep learning environment, uh, not only looking at the, the syntactic nature of the words, but also sort of semantic that comes from the sequence in which the words actually show up in textual content. And another thing that we do oftentimes is that we merge the textual content with the structured data kind of to unify structured unstructured data into a sort of flat file rows and columns and then use that for our explanatory or predictive 
or association type of models. Kind of enrichment of the data becomes quite useful as was the case in, in our movie prediction project. For many years, we actually used structured data, kind of extracting all those, uh, you know, what features um, has something to do with the financial success of the movie. And then we thought, why not use also text mining and then apply to the scripts or the summary of the scripts, the, the storylines, and then convert that into topics. And those topics would be additional features that we can use in our future space to predict the final success of the movie. So usually when you harmonize your structure and structured data into a single unified framework and then use it for prediction or explanation, you end up getting much better and, and more reliable and robust results. Okay, I think there is time uh, for the last question and I have the perfect last, last question. So um, somebody asked uh, what's the process to go about getting nine beginner certification. And of course I have a few slides to finish that. So let's see. Okay, so um, we have a bunch of NIME certifications. The, uh, the, the two levels, the first two level certification, L1, that uh, certifies your basic proficiency in NIME Analytics Platform, and L2, that certifies the advanced proficiency in NIME Analytics Platform. The next deadline is October 6. So here you have the link to register. Um, so that's, uh, if you want to be certified with NIME, you can register, you can take the exam, and, uh, and then if you pass, you're going to be certified. Uh, remember, two levels, L1 and L2. We have also a third level, L3, for uh, deployment usage. Um, how can you uh, know more about the basic proficiency in NIME Analytics Platform or the advanced proficiency in NIME Analytics Platform? We have courses, of course. You can take the online course because now we don't do on-site courses anymore. Uh, we, have, we have not been doing that for quite some time. Uh, so you can take the online course with Instructor. Uh, you can check our learning page. I'm going to post the link in the chat. Uh, and from the learning page, you can end on the... Um, on the course with instructor or on the self-paced courses. Uh, the self-paced courses, you can just uh, watch the video, do the exercises on your own time without the teacher. The uh, uh, online courses with instructor, you are supposed to do every day, one hour uh, with the instructor and then the exercises at home. Okay, and with that, then we can conclude. Uh, thank you very much. It's seven o'clock precisely sharp. Uh, I hope you enjoyed this panel and I hope we can see you again at the next webinar, October 1st, on the many case studies we have been working on with text mining. Thank you very much and bye. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.